Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. I'm Greg Caparaso. In this lecture, we're going to be starting to talk about the use of machine learning methods in bioinformatics. Now, machine learning is um, a relatively new and very expansive branch of statistics. Uh, and so we're just going to start um, to scratch the surface with these lectures. One thing that's very important, um, and I like to start talking about machine learning with this warning, is that it's very easy to misuse techniques in machine learning. And so if you're trying to apply these approaches in your own research, it's definitely a good idea to consult with somebody who knows more about them, particularly if this is a new area for you. There's a lot of pitfalls, um, and so while these techniques are very powerful, it's easy to um, fall into a trap and uh, do something wrong or do something misleading, um, even if you're not intending to do that. So when I think about machine learning, I typically start with thinking about the data, and I think that's a good place for us to jump in. Now, almost always, the data structure that you will um, use that is going to be very central to your machine learning analysis is what's called a feature table. Now you've probably already run into this in this course. Um, that's the same language that we use in Chain 2 for describing our sample by um, feature matrices. Um, and so this is an example that I have up here of a feature table from a famous data set that is widely used in, um, in teaching machine learning. Um, this is called the IRIS data set. Um, and some of the things to notice um, about this data set and this feature table um, is that the first column here contains what we're going to call the sample identifiers or the sample IDs. You can see in this case that they are simply ascending integers. Um, and there's a little bit of a summary um, down at the bottom of these tables. Um, and so this is telling us there's 150 rows. And so what that's telling us is that there's 150 samples in this data set. Now, in a feature table, each sample is represented by what, we, what we're going to call a sample vector. Um, and so that vector will contain the ID, um, and then it will contain certain data describing that sample. Um, now, what that data is, um, is what we call the different features of, uh, in the feature table. And so the columns in the feature table represent different features. And so here I'm highlighting um, a single feature vector. Um, this one is describing the petal length in centimeters. Um, and so just recall that um, this is a, the iris data set. So this is um, describing a set of flowers, a set of irises. Um, and one of the ways, one of the features that's used to describe these is the length of the petal in centimeters. Um, the other IDs um, for the different feature columns um, are all along the top. And so we have sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, all in centimeters. Um, and collectively, those are the feature identifiers. Um, and so um, taken together, that describes the full feature table. And so each cell in here um, is going to represent the value of a feature for one single sample. Now, some, uh, some types of machine learning methods use a second data structure here as well. Um, and I would refer to that one as the sample labels. And so this is um, simply just a vector where we have sample IDs associated with some label for each sample. Um, and in this case, um, you can't see all of this here, but there's three different species of iris represented in this data set. Um, and so the sample labels in this case just indicate the species of iris for each of the sample IDs. 
Um, and so importantly, when you have a feature table and sample labels, it's essential that you have a label for all of the samples that are represented in the feature table and that the sample IDs are the same in the feature table and in the sample label vector. Um, and so really regardless of what type of um, machine learning method you're using, this is essentially what the data is going to look like. Now there's some variations on this. Um, and so for example, um, the feature, the values in the feature table don't necessarily need to be quantitative values like what we have here. Um, these could be qualitative values. Um, so for example, um, something like color might be useful in this, or I could say flower color might be exam uh, useful in this example. Um, there you might imagine that you would have um, what, what I would call a controlled vocabulary. Um, so maybe there's a few specific flower colors that are relevant here. Um, uh, and so those could be categorical variables. Um, similarly, in the sample labels, um, we could also have um, continuous values instead of um, these categorical values. Um, and so if we were doing more of a regression analysis, say we were trying to do something like um, build a model of the overall height of the plant, say, um, maybe that's what we would have in this sample label vector would be plant height rather than plant species. Um, and so there's variations on the types of values that can be used here. And then some of the some machine learning methods will um, be able to use certain types of values, for example, quantitative versus qualitative values. Um, some will be able to use only one type or the other. Um, some will be able to use both mixed together. Um, similarly, some of the methods that use sample labels um, may operate only on qualitative values um, or categorical values like species is here, or they may only operate on quantitative or continuous values. Um, okay, so now that we've talked about the data, I want to talk about two high-level categories of machine learning methods. The first is what's called unsupervised learning methods. Um, and one of the, um, the easiest ways to tell whether you're working with um, an unsupervised learning method is that it operates on the feature table alone. So sample labels either are not used or they're not available. Um, and so you're just working on uh, that feature table, no sample labels. These methods are generally used to try to discover patterns in data. Um, so for example, understanding how samples might cluster together based on their similarity. Um, and so in other words, you might want to know which of these samples um, of, you know, say this 150 are most similar to which other samples. You could do that using an unsupervised learning method. The examples that we're going to focus on here are ordination methods, um, and these are um, two of these are principal coordinates analysis, or PCOA, or non-metric multidimensional scaling, or NMDS. Um, if you're unfamiliar with ordination, don't worry. We're going to spend some time on that. Um, and so. Overall, sort of the goal of unsupervised learning um, and specifically clustering, um, which is one of a few different types of unsupervised learning, is to take some kind of a feature table. Um, so where we've got samples and we've got features, um, do some type of analysis, run this through an algorithm. Um, so for example, maybe principal coordinates analysis, and then generate a simplified graphic that will help you discover patterns in the data. Um, and so in this example, um, what we're doing is um, we are taking this really high dimensional table. Um, and so this one has 12 rows or samples and 256 columns or features. 
Um, and you can see, if you look at that, it's hard to discern patterns in there. Um, so it's hard to, even though we're just looking at the first few features here, it's hard to get an idea of which of these samples are more similar to each other and which are more dissimilar to each other. In part because this is such a high dimensional data set, this feature table. So the idea is you would run it through some analysis where you would get a plot out the other end where each point represents a single sample from that feature table and the ones that are closer to each other in space are more similar to each other in their overall feature composition um, or overall in the values of their features. Um, and so, like I said, don't worry, um, this, uh, if you haven't encountered these methods before, this probably sounds very mysterious, how you go from one of these to another, but we're actually going to work through an example of that. The other high-level category of uh, machine learning methods um, is supervised learning, and so that's in contrast to unsupervised learning. Um, so this is typically going to operate on the feature table and the sample labels. Um, and so the, um, where the supervision comes in is that there are labels associated with each one of the samples. Um, and so these are typically used to develop a model um, that can classify new data um, and so, for example, um, an email spam filter is often um, developed using supervised learning. And so the idea here is by looking at a whole bunch of email messages, some of which are labeled as spam and some of which are labeled as not spam, you might be able to develop a model that can assess a new email as it comes in to your mail server and decide whether that should go to a spam filter or whether that should go to the inbox. Um, another example, bioinformatics related, would be something like a disease classifier. And so imagine that you have, um, say, some genetic data, um, so maybe SNP data from a human genome, and you might want to um, build a classifier that can use that SNP data to make a prediction of whether an individual is more likely to develop a disease or less likely to develop a specific disease. Um, in that case, you would have um, samples by SNPs as your feature table, and then you would have labels that describe whether each individual, or each sample in this case, um, is coming from an individual who has the disease or who does not have the disease. Examples of supervised learning methods include naive Bayes, random forests, and support vector machines, um, but there's really very, very many of these. Um, so now to just work through um, a, a little bit of a discussion of how this might work, um, like with a supervised learning method, you might be using an algorithm to, um, say, try and differentiate um, photos of dogs from photos of cats. And so what you would do is you would build some sort of a feature table that's going to describe the dogs and is going to describe the cats. So it's going to describe some set of samples um, in terms of some features that you define. We'll talk about defining features in a few minutes. It will also then take labels, so it'll say whether each sample represents a dog or a cat. Um, and then the idea would be to take um, unlabeled photos as input, um, and so you might have something coming into the system, and you want to know, does this get classified as a dog, or does this get classified as a cat? Um, and you can imagine this kind of thing might be useful for doing image classification. And so when you do, um, say, a Google search and you want photos of cats, um, you can imagine that behind the scenes, maybe there's a classifier that is evaluating images and assigning them to a category of, say, photos of cats. Um, and so the way that this might work is based on feature data that's coming in. Um, the classifier might build a model. 
Um, and so you as the user of this or the developer of this machine learning model might say, okay, some of the features of interest here are the body length and the type of vocalization. Um, I realize now vocalization, of course, doesn't work if these are photos, um, but imagine um, just that is some feature that you're describing. Um, and so um, if you take input of, say, some, um, some photo of a dog or a cat, whatever this is, um, you can um, assign these features. You can say body length, you can say vocalization, um, and behind the scenes, a model could be run. Um, in this case, it's this is sort of like a decision tree model where it says, okay, what's the body length? If it's greater than a half a meter, then we're going to classify it as a dog. If it's less than a half a meter, we're going to do some more investigation and we're going to want to know what the vocalization is. Um, does it bark or does it meow? And then based on that information, you could put this photo into a category. Um, and hopefully our classifier would recognize that this photo is, of course, of peanut. Um, and now the um, these methods get um, pretty complex because a lot of time a lot of the time we're not able to get a perfect description of all the features from what we get as input and so we might get something um, that's noisier than what we might hope and so um, for example rather than getting a photo we might get something that's a little bit more pixelated like this cross stitch of peanut and so it's the um, uh, part of the performance of this classifier is going to be determined by how well these descriptive features can be pulled from whatever it is that's provided as input. Um, if we think about bioinformatics and the SNP example that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, that noise that's coming into the system might be error in our sequencing data. Um, and so supervised learning um, like I said, is going to be taking a feature table and it's going to be taking labels or metadata um, as input. Um, and this is a type of approach that um, can be used either for categorical data or for numeric data. Um, and so, for example, with categorical data, um, you might be classifying like body site from microbiome samples. Um, and so you can see like gut, left palm, right palm, tongue are some examples of different labels. Um, with a regressor, we're going to have a numeric target. Um, and so we might be trying to, um, say, uh, predict an individual's age from, uh, from say, microbiome composition. So the focus of today's lecture is going to be on unsupervised learning. But before we get there, I just want to talk through a couple of examples of supervised learning in action in bioinformatics. The first is from a study that my lab published in 2016, which was focused on microbiomes in the built environment. Now, the built environment um, describes spaces that we inhabit, and so that can be our homes, that can be our offices, it can be our cars, it can be the space station, um, basically um, environments that humans have created and occupy is typically what's described as the built environment. Now, in this study, we were specifically trying to understand how surface material and uh, geography impact microbiomes uh, associated with offices, or in other words, the, the microbes that are in the offices that we spend so much of our time in, or at least that I spend so much of my time in, um, and trying to understand if we should expect to find different microbes on different surface types. Um, and so, for example, drywall, um, versus carpet versus ceiling tile um, and if we should expect to see different microbiome compositions in different cities uh, in offices and so the way that we did this um, or one of the ways that we did this was we built supervised learning classifiers and we used random forest classifiers in this analysis which is one type of supervised learning method and what we did was we um, compiled a very large number of samples, 
Um, and then we, um, as features, used 16S ribosomal RNA sequence variants. Um, and so in other words, um, short 16S sequences indicating the presence of different microbes were used as the features. And the values in that matrix were counts of each feature in each sample. So each time we observed a specific amplicon sequence variant, we tallied that up as um, a count of that feature for a given sample. We then provided that as input to a machine learning classifier, Random Forests, and what we did was we um, had it develop a model to try and predict the city that a sample came from. So whether it was Flagstaff, um, in this study it was Flagstaff, San Diego, and Toronto. Um, based on what microbes were found on the surfaces in that office. Um, and so these um, visualizations that I have up here are what are known as confusion matrices. And I talk about these in the um, corresponding book chapter to this lecture in uh, IAB. Um, and so what this is showing is, um, we'll look at panel A here. Um, and so this is showing the actual label of the sample. And so this would be for a given sample, the label that's in that label vector. And then on the other axis, it's showing the predicted label. And so what did our machine learning classifier predict for a given sample? Um, now you can see this is like a heat map scale. So we're going from yellows to blues here. Um, so blues indicate that you have um, many correct classifications, a high proportion of correct classifications. Um, that's because in this case, the true label say is Flagstaff and the predicted label is also Flagstaff. Um, here, true label is San Diego, the predicted label is San Diego. Here, the true label is Toronto, the predicted label is Toronto. Um, and so when you see the like hot colors on this color scale um, showing up on the diagonal, that suggests that you have a good classifier. Um, what this is showing, like, so for example, here, this is showing that we have a sample that was actually from San Diego and it's being classified as coming from Flagstaff. And so that's an error that the classifier made here. Um, and so what this tells us and what we learned from building this classifier is that it's possible to identify what sample an indoor environment microbiome, or sorry, what city an indoor microbiome environment, uh, environmental sample came from based on the composition of the microbiomes or what bacterial sequences you observe. Um, now, interestingly, um, in each of these cities, we had three offices. Interestingly, we were not able to do very well with the office predictions. And so you see like we got some of these right. So like the diagonal might be a little bit darker than the spaces around it. Um, but we tend to confuse samples from the same city with one another. Um, and so like we see more dark colors here in this square. Um, and so that what that tells us is sometimes we are misclassifying the Flagstaff 1 office as the Flagstaff 2 or the Flagstaff 3 office, and then less frequently as the offices from other cities. Um, and so that tells us um, that while we can predict the city, we're not so good at predicting the um, office within a given city. Um, and so that gives us an idea of the um, explanatory power of that microbiome. Um, and so we did this um, in this study and we do similar things in other studies. I'm gonna point one out to you, and another one out to you in just a minute. Um, but I also wanted to share um, something uh, surprising that came out of this result for me, um, which ended up being probably one of my proudest moments as a scientist. Um, but that was when The Onion covered this article. Um, and so you can see they published an article um, soon after our paper came out um, about cities having a unique bacterial fingerprint. 
Um, and I think that um, Phoebe makes uh, an incredible point here. Um, she says, amazing, if I ever want to know what city I'm in, all I need is a microscope. Um, which of course is um, funny and a good point. Um, you know, why would you need this classifier? What is this classifier actually, what value does this provide? We know what environment, or we know what city each of these samples came from. Why do we need to go through all these costs, like doing the 16S sequencing and then um, building this classifier and running this classifier? Um, and of course, we don't. Um, you know, the point here is not that we are going to um, use this to classify, say, microbiome samples that come from unknown cities, um, but we can learn a lot by the fact that we are able to build a classifier that works. Um, and so I'm going to show you another example, um, also from my lab more recently. This is a paper we just published this past February, February of 2022. Um, and this was, um, this was a study where um, we are collaborating with a group that is focused on um, cervical vaginal cancers. And we are collecting information um, from patients about um, the vaginal microenvironment. And so including things like microbiome composition, um, immunoproteome, um, metabolome, and so what small molecule metabolites are present, um, and then also patient-related um, covariates, so age, BMI, ethnicity. Um, and in this study, what we were doing was we were trying to figure out which of these microbiome feature types, so metabolites or microbiome or um, immune markers, were most predictive of um, host phenotype um, and particularly um, as related to disease. And so some of the host phenotype features that we were interested in were lactobacillus dominance of the vaginal microbiota. That's typically associated with health, with healthier states, um, vaginal pH, genital inflammation, and disease status, um, going from HPV negative, um, HPV positive, um, and uh, all the way up to um, cancer phenotypes. Um, and so, again, this is a similar um, kind of situation where, you know, we don't necessarily need to be able to predict this from um, these data from microbiomes and metabolomes and immunoproteomes. In fact, those are pretty expensive to collect, and so they're probably not um, the best diagnostic tools here. Um, but rather, what we end up trying to do is figure out which features of the microbiome or the metabolome, say, are useful for predicting some feature of interest. So like in this case, in this plot, um, this one is focused on the inflammation status, and we measure that as none, low, or high. Um, and so what we see when we look at this confusion matrix is we do have the darker, um, warmer colors on the diagonal here. So that suggests that we have a reasonably good performing classifier. We're going to talk about how you evaluate classifier performance um, uh, a little bit later. This is also covered in IAB. Um, and one of the things that you can do when you have a reasonably good performing classifier is you can look at which features were useful in the model that was built. Um, and so, for example, here, um, so in this predictor of inflammation, we can see um, these are um, different lipids in blue. Um, other metabolites like glucose in the darker blue, um, and then immunoproteomic signatures in red. And so what we can do is we can get an idea of which of these features were useful in building a machine learning classifier that is able to predict inflammation. And so that, on, um, that bit could be useful for better understanding the disease. So, you know, for example, why are these features 
associated with um, being able to differentiate these um, these different states, uh, different inflammation states. Um, or it could be useful in developing new diagnostics. And so by taking this sort of very broad approach where we're looking at as much as we can, we're taking an untargeted look, um, say at the microbiome or at metabolites, we can use this type of information to try and hone in on what diagnostic features there are. And then we can develop um, more targeted, um, probably more cost-effective assays that could be useful in, say, developing early cancer markers. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples of um, how supervised learning is used in bioinformatics and in microbiome research. Um, so the first step in either a supervised learning or an unsupervised learning analysis um, after you've collected the feature, the samples really, is defining what the features are. Um, and so in the IRIS data set that I mentioned earlier, the features are physical features of the samples, and the samples in this case are individual plants. Um, and so again, that was things like the sepal length, the petal length, and so on, for the 150 different samples that we have in this data set. Um, if we're doing something with biological sequences, um, so for example, attempting to do taxonomic assignment of biological sequences, um, in this case, each sample might represent a different sequence that we want to um, know the taxonomy of. Um, the features could, for example, be k-mers. Um, remember that k-mers are k-adjacent characters in a sequence. Um, so it could be the k-mers that are observed in the samples, and in this case, the samples are sequences. Um, and so, for example, like this is saying that GAAT is observed three times in this first sequence ID. AATG is observed two times in this sequence ID. ATGA is observed three times, and so on. Um, you could also imagine features being things like GC content or sequence length. Um, it really just depends on um, where you obtain those sequences and what information you have access to. Um, often you, will, um, you may end up doing some sort of a feature selection step in your analysis too, um, where you use a computational algorithm to try and determine which features are more or less useful for differentiating um, different classes in a supervised learning task. Um, and of course, my focus is often on microbiome data. Um, and so in a microbiome analysis, um, the sequences could be amplicon sequence variants, um, they could be taxa, they could be metabolites, they, should, they could be um, functional genes. Um, there's really a huge variety of things that they could, they could be. You could also consider combining these different feature types, and that's what we did in that cervical vaginal cancer um, paper I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and, um, the, uh, and then we're simply describing um, how many times we're observing each feature in each sample. Uh, and so in this case, this would be saying I'm observing amplicon sequence variant 1 42 times in sample 4AC2. And we could then use this information as input um, either to an unsupervised or to a supervised uh, learning algorithm. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there for this first introductory lecture. There's gonna be two more lectures in this series. The next one is gonna cover unsupervised learning in more detail, and then the last one will cover supervised learning in more detail. In both cases, we're gonna go through worked examples that you can generally uh, do with a pen and paper. And so my goal with that is to help you understand um, what are somewhat, uh, what are often considered somewhat mysterious processes. See you next time.